There is no more controversial topic in the body of Christ than this issue of once saved, always saved, eternal security, um, loss of salvation, forfeiture of salvation, walking away, what have you. Whatever you want to call it, there is nothing that can be sometimes more divisive. I don't know why it should be that divisive, but I understand people's passions. But there's no more controversial topic than that. And so what I want to do is I want to go and look at not just what I believe, but also what maybe some of the best scholars in Greek have to believe. Because there are those that will say, well, Corey, I don't trust your Greek, or I think that you're using Greek in such a way to make it fit what you're saying. So I want to do is I want to look at the people who actually uh, teach Greek, and they do so not because they're trying to get a particular point across, because there are people who don't even believe in one saved, always saved, or eternal security, who also are trying to learn Greek. And so to do so would discredit them. They would lose an awful lot, certainly in a way of credibility, if they're trying to make a particular Greek text fit in a way that it shouldn't fit. Now, I w before I go to look at them, I want to also do something that uh, that <clears throat> it may be beneficial. Some people say that you maybe heard this, that the early church did not believe in eternal security. Well, first of all, that's not true. There are those who did believe and there are those who did not in terms of what percentage. It's not even all that important. Why? Because we don't put or we should not put a whole lot of emphasis on what they did or did not believe. Why? Well, there's a reason why these people are not in the Bible. There's a reason why the early church fathers, their writings are not part of the canon. Why? Because the Holy Spirit did not guide them, meaning that no matter how soon after the church is founded, no matter who their uh, direct uh, apostles were, doesn't mean that what they believe holds more weight than what we believe. In fact, if you look at what the early church fathers believed, you're going to find that, their way, that they were differing on a lot of different topics. Some they were questioning or differing on the actual age of Christ when he died. There was even some that even thought that he may have been in his 40s or 50s. There were those that thought that the uh, that he would return, that Christ would return in their lifetime. There were those that had wide variety, varying views, some on the Trinity, some thinking that the Holy Spirit was uh, a creation instead of being a person of the triune Godhead. There were those that had varying beliefs. Some of them we would may even consider by today's standard as heretics. The other question is, who is, who determines who a church father is? Most of their writings, however, are not extant, meaning that most of their writings haven't survived. And so we're not even totally sure who believed what. And there are some beliefs that we never got to hear of. But that being the case, this notion that no one in the early church, at least that we know of, believed in eternal security is just not true. So let's look at a couple examples. And then all we've got to say is that these couple of examples will at least prove that there were some, whether you want to say it was half, 30 percent, 10 percent, doesn't matter. There were still some that actually believed that. And so here we've got <clears throat> Lactantius, who is from A.D. 320. Virtue is perpetual without any intermission, nor can it depart from him who has once received it. Well, there's an early church father. How about this next person? This comes from Iranius of Lyons. But when the spirit pervades the man within and without, inasmuch as it continues there, it never leaves him. As a matter of fact, go to Clement of Alexandrinus. We shall not fall into corruption who pass through into corruption because he sustains us for he hath said and he will do it. He also states that uh, his, that is Christ's goodness towards them who through hearing have believed is immovable and turns neither one way nor the other. This was from AD 190. And then many of you know of Oregon, this is from AD 230. Our soul is enlightened either with the true light, which shall never be put out, which is Christ, or if it has not in it that light, which is eternal, without a doubt, it is enlightened with a temporal and extinguishable light, extinguishable light by him who transforms himself into an angel of light, meaning, all of them seem to be backing up the fact that if you do have uh, the spirit in you, if you are a believer, then that is not going to change. However, are there those who believe differently in the early church? Sure. Just like we have today. But what I want to do is I want to look at what the um, scholars believe. I don't mean just any old scholars. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because there might be some that think that, hey, Corey, I think that the way that you use Greek might not be correct. I think you understand Greek some may think that I don't, but you understand Greek, but not in a way to where you are using it properly. 
I was even told once by someone who didn't know a particular Greek rule that I shared that Greek rule to him and that he told me that even though he didn't know before, since I explained it to him, now he understands it and I'm wrong about it. I okay. think it's, a, it's an improper use of that, that, that rule. That's it. And, and all, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is this, if, if, if you're going to say that it's an improper use of the rule and you don't know the rule, that how do you make that statement? And I do know the rule. You educated me on it, and I can see that you're improperly using it, because that's what I thought before. And now today, I've confirmed. I don't agree with your use of the rule. Okay. Nor Daniel Wallace has said that that's his commentary, that he comes to the conclusion. Absolutely not. And now that I know that he is what? OSAS, I'm really going to be skeptical. I'll take it, but I'm also going to find others. And when I find others, they're going to say, no, I can't say that it says that. It does take a little bit of arrogance to say something like that. You never knew the rule before, but once it was explained to you, now you're sure that the person explained it to you doesn't know what they're talking about. That's fine. And so to make this point, I want to go ahead and bring in a couple scholars. Uh, these are not just any old scholars. These are the scholars that other scholars turn to. For example, let me name, name some names. Bill Mount. He is the, the writer. It's his textbook, Basics of Biblical Greek, where if you want to learn Greek, a lot of people, that might be the go-to book. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of seminaries that actually use that particular book to teach Greek. But then we also have Dr. Daniel Wallace, who is clearly an eminent Greek scholar. He is, his book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, is a go-to, it's a must-have for uh, many grammarians. Uh, you probably wouldn't use it as a textbook because it's just it's just too cumbersome and just too much information. And it's hard to remember all those different things. But he is the guy that people turn to, to also inquire about some of the Greek writings, what some of these things mean. And we're talking about Koine Greek, not not uh, modern Greek. As a matter of fact, his work is the work, because of his work, we have some of the Greek manuscripts that we have now available for us to go and look either online because of his uh, diligence to go and to study and to make copies so that you couldn't, obviously you can't go to a certain museum and actually put your hands on the text. Then we got someone like a D.A. Carson, who uh, his book such as Exegetical Fallacies is a must have. He is clearly an eminent scholar uh, among scholars. We've also got people like uh, Bois Fannin. We've got people like uh, Michael Burr, who has written literally Greek, <laughs> part of the Greek New Testament. And so we've got people like that. We're going to consult them to see, is it just me or is there a basis for why they believe what they believe? Particularly one particular passage that comes up a lot, John 10. Let me just let me just bring this up briefly. Um, one, actually, there's two passages in John 10. John 10, 27, you all have heard me cover this a thousand times. And I've stated that at present, I still have not found one Greek scholar who will refute what I'm saying, not disagree with what I'm saying, I've never said that there's no Greek scholar that would disagree with what I'm saying. I'm saying there's no Greek scholar that I found that could take this text and disagree on the basis of the Greek. And what do I mean? One, as we look at this passage, there is no condition set here. Jesus is simply explaining who his sheep are. I think that's important. Uh, any seminarian, any any uh, scholar would tell you, as a matter of fact, any scholar, whether they be a Greek scholar, a Hebrew scholar, where they be a, a Bible expositionist, whoever it is, they would tell you to take away from the text, don't impose anything on the text. And so what we find in this in this statement or these statements that Jesus is making, he's not putting a condition upon the sheep. For example, in John 10 verses, starting verse, starting verse three, speaking about Jesus, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and lead them out. Now, Obviously, who are we talking about? What is Jesus called? He is called the good shepherd. And so if he's the good shepherd, as a matter of fact, the Bible says, but he who enters the door is a shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus is this shepherd. We're going to also look at the Old Testament in just a little bit and see what um, God says is going to be a result of when this good shepherd comes. And also what happens with the sheep to whom this, this shepherd or, or to whom belong to the shepherd. But he says to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. The sheep hear his voice. There's no condition set here, just a statement of fact that the sheep hear the shepherd's voice and the shepherd calls his own sheep by name. They're his own sheep. They belong to him and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him. So what is Jesus saying? The sheep follow him. Why? Because they know. They know his voice. Notice what? Notice what Jesus is saying. He's giving a reason for even why they're doing so. He's not giving a condition. He's not saying the sheep must do this. He's just saying the sheep 
will do this. That his sheep, his sheep will follow. His sheep know his voice. And he says, a stranger, they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Now, this term here that they simply will not follow it's actually a lot stronger in the Greek. We have a future active indicative, akaluthesis, which is they will follow, but it is negated. There's a double negation, a u may. Uh, one negation is sufficient. You would think it would be enough, but to make sure it's as emphatic as can be, to say that nothing in the future, they will never in the future do this. They will never, ever in the future, u may, akaluthesis, and ever in the future follow, but they will flee. So instead of even following a, a strange voice, they will flee. And he tells us why. From him, because they do not know the voice of the stranger. So now that takes me into something that Jesus says in verses 27 and 28. But it's clear Jesus is telling us what his sheep will do and what they won't do, that they will follow him and follow him only. Now, how does that look like? Does it look like that every every now and then they may seem to hear? To look around may seem to kind of waver a little bit, may nibble a little bit here, a little bit there. It may be, do sheep follow the shepherd in a straight line? Not necessarily, probably not. But do they ultimately follow him? Yes. Do they go after another strange voice? Jesus says his sheep will not. As a matter of fact, he talks about not just his sheep that are Jewish. He talks about his sheep that are also Gentile. He speaks about it in verse 14, says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fault. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice. That's speaking, he's speaking to the Jews, but he's speaking also to these Gentiles that are very soon afterwards going to start coming to him. He says, they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So he's speaking not what they have to do, but what they will do. This is pretty clear upon the text. And so if we were to write a paper, we couldn't, couldn't add anything but what the text says. You couldn't come away with anything other than the fact that Jesus' sheep know him. He knows them. They hear his voice. They follow after his voice. They will follow after his voice. They will not follow after a stranger, but will flee the strange voice. And then when we get to the more the more controversial passage uh, that I said that this particular passage cannot be uh, underestimated and it cannot be refuted. Because what's happening is in the most emphatic way, Jesus is saying it is impossible for his sheep now or into the future ever to perish. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Jesus is not saying if they hear my voice, they will follow me. If they do, he, he's, there's no condition placed here. And so it'd be wrong for someone to come and put that into the text that there's a condition there. There is no condition here. As much as some would like for it to be, there is no condition there. And he says, and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, here's where the controversy comes in. There's a particular rule here, this emphatic negation that we saw earlier, but instead of it negating a future active indicative, it is negating a subjunctive. A subjunctive is a, a, a an expression, a, a word that would express possibility, potentiality, probability. And so saying, stating here, this word apolontai, it's a subjunctive. They may perish, possibly perish. And so if you negate that, they may not perish. But the way that you eliminate even the possibility, saying that it's impossible, how you would say that something is impossible in the Greek is you would double negate that word in the subjunctive. And here we have this ume apolontai. And it's not just once they get saved that they'll never perish. We have from now into eternity, which is why we have this passage here, eis ton iona. So now there will be those that will disagree. So what I want to do now is I just want to go and look and see what the experts say, the people who actually write these books for a living, the people who are consulted by other Greek scholars. These would be, I guess, for a better way of putting it, the scholar of the scholars. And so I want to start off with one, this rule. Matter of fact, before I get to the rule, um, one of my seminary professors that I, I asked about, I asked him, am I understanding this correctly? Because I don't want to just say something and be wrong. So I inquired of a seminary professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, a man by the name of Michael Burr. Now, before I, I show you his response, to show you that this man is eminently qualified, these are some of his writings. The New English Translation, Novum Testament, Grace, which uh, is the New Testament. This is the Greek New Testament. He also is a writer of 
uh, a new reader's lexicon of the Greek New, Text new Testament, as well as the New International Dictionary of the New Testament Theology and Exegesis. This man obviously is qualified. When you can actually help to write a Greek New Testament and also write a lexicon, I think you know what you're talking about. And so I gave her, I, I sent him an email, and in my email I asked him, uh, here you see my, uh, my Dallas Theological Seminary uh, email, and I'm asking him about this. But rather than asking him in, in type, I just simply just emailed it to him because it'd just be easier to explain. I could pull this screen up and show him what I'm talking about. And so let's look at his response. His response is, uh, Corey, great question. I think you have understood the text perfectly well. The emphatic negation in John 10, 28 shows that Jesus' sheep will never, ever perish. It is absolutely impossible for that to happen. He says, great job on understanding the Greek and using Wallace to understand the grammatical point properly. So Michael Brewer, who is also a scholar, um, noted scholar, and obviously a published scholar agrees with my assessment. Now, he, he points to uh, Daniel Wallace's point. So let's go ahead and read uh, what Daniel Wallace says this particular rule. The rule is, and this is found in Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, page 468, says the emphatic negation is indicated by u may plus the error subjunctive or less frequently u may plus the future active indicative. The future active indicative, that's what we saw in verses four and five where he says they will never, ever follow after this strange voice. So going back to it, that was, I just want to bring up for the, just for a point of emphasis, just to show you, uh, or an example. Then he says, this is the strongest way to negate something in Greek. One might think that the negative with the subjunctive could not be as strong as the negative with the indicative. However, while ou plus the indicative denies a certainty, ou may plus the subjunctive denies a potentiality. And so if we drop down just a little bit more, he says that uh, just before we get to the end of it, he says, Ume rules out even the idea as being a possibility. Ume is the most decisive way of negativing something in the future. So it rules out, notice what he says, rules out the possibility of something even happening. And it does so it rules out it happening in the future. Let's go back to it. And he says, the last part, he says, the emphatic negation of the last paragraph, Emphatic negation is found primarily in the reported sayings of Jesus, both in the Gospels and the Apocalypse, secondarily in quotations from the LXX or from the Septuagint. Outside of these two sources, it occurs only rarely. As well, a soteriological theme is frequently found in such statements. So what he's saying is there is a theme when, when you see this double negation of a subjunctive, it's usually surrounding a uh, salvific theme. And look what he says. He says, uh, especially in John, what is negative is the possibility of the loss of salvation. Now, the question is, is he speaking about John 10, 28? Well, let's just hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Negation subjunctive. Again, we're still dealing with the independent subjunctive uses. And this is specifically ume plus the aorist subjunctive. I want you to notice a couple things. It's, it's the aorist subjunctive, and it's u may. It's not may u. Now, may u is a double negative that really is negating the negative. U may is not really quite the same thing as a double negative. What it's doing is it's a strong negative on the possible negative. The u is normally used with indicatives, but it's used with may, which normally goes with the oblique moods. And the may is saying, uh, uh, this is not likely. And then u is saying, this is not even possible, not even likely. It's a, it's a strengthened negative of the may. This is, in fact, the strongest way to negate a point in Greek. While u negates a certainty, u may negates even the possibility, in other words. So here's a great illustration in John 10.28 and another one in Romans 4.8. John 10.28, when uh, you have the Good Shepherd narrative, the Lord says, I give them eternal life, and they will not at all perish. Ume apollontai. What's interesting about the emphatic negation is that the speaker or writer who uses it by far the most in the New Testament is actually Jesus. It's more on the lips of Jesus than anyone else in the New Testament. And what's also significant 
is the way he uses it routinely and, and mostly is to speak about salvation and how someone who is saved cannot get lost. Here's a great place where he says this, I give them eternal life and they will not at all perish or they will never perish as, a, as an, a, a quite adequate translation. So listening to this, we can kind of hear him. Now, this is him making that statement. And what does he say? He says the exact same thing that I said. As a matter of fact, to be correct, I'm saying what he says. And this is not a, a really controversial rule, a debated rule. This is just what the rule states. And so to state that what's being negative is not the possibility of loss of salvation, then someone would have to say, what then does this ume in the Greek mean? What is being doubly negated? Well, clearly what's being negated is this apolontai or apolontai. What's being negated is the possibility of perishing. And you can't come back and say again that this refers to only after you make it into heaven, as long as you remain. That's not what the saying. How do we know? Because this ice ton, I don't know, which is what he mentioned, this into the ages or into eternity. So he's telling us that the future possibility of this being negated or the future possibility of perishing is negated. It is doubly negated. Now, what I want to do is I want to just pull out actually in case someone was look interested. Here is the book that I'm speaking of. Mine's a little bit, a bit used and so forth, but this Greek grammar beyond the basic from him. But I also want to turn to someone else who's also eminently qualified. Obviously, Bill Mounts, who now I have an older version. This is a I'm not sure how old this thing is, the second edition. So this is pretty old. I think it's on the fourth or fifth edition right now. And so uh, there's a particular page that I want, want to turn your attention to. And so for that, I want to go over here to Lagos and pull up the screen for Lagos. And I want to pull up something he says now. It's also understood that he believes that you cannot lose your salvation. He's spoken about it in different ways. But I want to pull up uh, this this part of the book, this is where he gets to subjunctive. I don't know if you all can read this. As a matter of fact, let me make this just a little bit bigger. If you look in the bottom, the bottom right hand corner, uh, and let's just read it. it says, when we listen to someone we care about. Matter of fact, I don't want to read the whole thing. This is part of the exegetical insight. I want to drop down to when he's speaking about the subjunctive. Now, this is this is two people that's making a statement. This is not just him. Matter of fact, let's come back to the full screen. This is not just him. This is a man by the name of Buis Fannin who also understands this is his book who's also a scholar he wrote, he writes with uh, Daryl Bach interpreting the New Testament text. And so these people are well-known, well-respected scholars. Again, Mounts, this is his lexicon. And so does Mounts know his Greek? Well, sure, he, he writes a textbook on Greek and he also has a lexicon on Greek. So let's go back to Lagos and let's read what he says about or actually he and Buis Fanning, mainly this is Buis Fanning, but it's in his book and he concurs. And so let's see what he says here. He says, this chapter describes a fascinating combination used by the Greek language. I don't know if you all can see the, the cursor here where I am. Uh, a fascinating combination used by the Greek language to show an emphasis. It is you. It is the use of the two negatives, u and may, both of these words, u and may means no, not, never. Um, and so it is used, it is used as ume with a subjunctive verb to indicate a strong negation about the future. The speaker uses the subjunctive uh, to suggest a future possibility. But in the same phrase, he emphatically denies, by means of the double negation, that such could ever happen. So this could never happen. This, uh, this linguistic combination occurs about 85 times in the New Testament, often in significant promises or reassurances about the future. In Jesus' description of himself as the good shepherd, which we're reading in John 10, he gives one of the most treasured of these promises. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life and they shall never perish. U me apolontai or apolontai. He says, it would have been enough to have u with the future active indicative verb here, but Jesus is more emphatic. So he could have just said just the just the ooh or may with the, the subjunctive, and that would have been enough. But to make it clear that the possibility is negated, it is impossible. So you could not come back and say, well, yes, but here's a possibility. What if this? Anything that you can think of, meaning if you thought of, well, what if you stop, what if you stop believing? What if you stop following? What if you convert to Islam? 
what if, what if, any if that you can bring up, it has been negated. Meaning, not to say that a person can convert to Islam and then go to heaven, not to say that a person can renounce Christ, that a person can do all, whatever you can think of, it's to state that clearly these things will not happen. And there is a reason why these things won't happen, but we'll come back to the reason why these things won't happen in the future uh, in just a little bit. But he says, uh, the subjunctive combination strongly denies even the possibility that any of Jesus' sheep would ever perish. They will certainly not perish. They will by no means perish is the sense of Jesus' assertion. This is reinforced by, look what he says, by the addition of the phrase, Aistan Aona, forever. Jesus' emphatic promise is the bedrock of assurance and godly motivation for every one of his sheep. That's what he's found it. Now, the issue is, do you have to remain a sheep? Well, sure, I, you are going to remain a sheep, that, but there is no condition there. It's obvious, it has to be implied. We can't come back and say, well, yeah, this is true if you remain. That's not what the text says. Jesus is stating what his, what's going to happen with his sheep. So with that being said, I want to pull up something by D.A. Carson, who is clearly well-known, highly thought of an eminent scholar. He's a scholar among scholars. These are people that other scholars go to, that they look to, that they ask to, that they use their material. Remember, these are people who have been on these translation committees. They have translated the Greek test, New Testament into English. They have their lexicons. And so you want to, matter of fact, they may have students that use these other gentlemen's um, books as textbooks. And so it's vitally important that we at least give credit. You may think they're wrong. You, it, and it's okay. It's fine to think that I disagree with Wallace or I disagree with Mounds or I disagree with Dr. Brewer or uh, I disagree with uh, Dr. D.A. Carson. That's fine. But you have to give the reason why, according to the Greek they're using. If And, and we're only talking about Greek. There are going to be some folks that could care less about the Greek. They think that we use the Greek too much, that we're misinterpreting the Greek, which is kind of hard to understand if you don't know the Greek. There are some people that say, well, I don't need the Greek. You don't need the Greek to understand. But there are some times where the Greek can actually settle an argument. Why? The Bible was given to us in Hebrew and Greek. Why not use it? Why not at least come to an understanding? It would be that it takes some humility to say, you know what? I've got to go off what the words say. I cannot, I cannot deny that two plus two equals four, no matter how much I wish that it would that it would equate to five. And that's what we do sometimes. Sometimes we would want our conclusions to be uh, the standard and then make how we got there fit. That we cannot do that. If the grammar, words have meaning, grammar, there's rules to language, whether it be English, Spanish, Mandarin, or Greek or Hebrew. And so in this case, we want to look, listen to uh, Dr. D.A. Carson. As a matter of fact, before we go and consult what he says about the particular passage, I just want to play a clip from him speaking about the insurance, the assurance of salvation and why we have assurance of salvation. Picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown, remarkably Jewish names. <laughs> the day before the first Passover, having a little discussion in the land of Goshen, and Smith says to Brown, boy, are you a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? And Brown says, well, God told us what to do through his servant Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the, the lamb and daubed the two doorposts with blood, put blood on the lintel? Haven't you, you done that? You're all ready and packed to go? You're going to eat the, the whole Passover meal with your family? Well, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. But still pretty scary when you think of all the things that have happened around here recently you know flies and river turning to blood and it's pretty awful and 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 now there's a threat of the firstborn being killed you know it's all right for you you got three sons I've only got one and I love my Charlie and 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 and, and the angel of death is passing through tonight you, you, you know I, I know what, what God says and I put the blood there but but it's pretty scary I'll be glad when this night is over and the other one responds bring it on I trust the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Which one lost his son? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because death doesn't pass over them on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised but on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. That's what silences the accuser. 
The blood silences the accuser of the brothers as he accuses us before God. He silences our consciences when he accuses us directly. How many times do we writhe in agony asking if God can ever love us enough, if God can ever care for us enough after we've done such stupid, sinful, rebellious things, after being Christians for 40 years? What are you going to say? Well, you know, God, I, I tried hard, you know? I did, I did my best. It was, a, it was a bad moment. No, 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 no. I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Yes. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. There is the ground of all human assurance before God. There is the ground of our faith, not guaranteeing intensity of faith, so fickle are we. It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves. They overcome him on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. I think that absolutely is powerful what he's saying. What he's speaking of, we won't go too much into it, but he's speaking about how uh, the atoning work on the cross is what saves us. Remember, we have a picture in the Old Testament under the law, the Day of Atonement. We have a high priest who would intercede on behalf of us by means of blood being shed to pay the price, and then all the sins being confessed on the head of the scapegoat and being sent away. So this, the picture is this. The sins of the people are laid on uh, an object to take these sins away, away from the presence of God, from the presence of the people, out of the camp, to be seen no more, to be thought of no more. And then the price that must be paid for these sins is laid on this this other animal who sheds his blood and the people after afflicting their souls and humbling themselves uh, will stand there as the Lord would accept this offering and they would then stand in uh, justification in right standing before the Lord because of this offering and there is his priest that mediates between the two and intercedes on behalf of the people to God but what we have now is we have Jesus who does the exact same thing he plays a part of the scapegoat of the offering as well as the mediator who the Bible says is always mediating on our behalf. Romans 8, 34, uh, Hebrews 7, 25, I believe, and 1 John 2, 1. And so we have this Lord who's always, always constantly mediating, speaking, interceding on our behalf. He was the lamb who took away the sins of the world. He took the place of the scapegoat. He also shed his blood on the altar on the offer. And so that what is what paid for our sins. And as Paul says, that debt that was owed from, by us to the Lord, which required death, Jesus pays and pays that debt nailed to the cross. That's what he's speaking about. And so that's what causes us to be saved. That's what keeps us safe. And what keeps us walking in him is the Holy Spirit that comes as a result of that, of that placement of faith in him. But I want to go back to, to Lagos real quick. And so we're speak, still speaking about John 10 to make sure that we're following along with now with D.A. Carson, how he believes John 10, 28 is. And so let's go back to John 10, 28. Here it says that, and I give him eternal life. And so now I have this here. What I want to do is you all can't see this here. Let me move this down. If I can do this, let me, uh-oh. What I just, there it is. Let me move this down here so you guys can see. This is the Gospel according to John. This is D.A. Carson's Bible commentary. So what I want to do is, let me make this a little bit bigger because I want to make sure that you guys can, can read this along with me. Let's make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to read this out loud. Uh, this is speaking about John 10, 28. We're going to read two things. One from this particular book. We're not going to read his book, Exegetical Fallacy, but we're going to read from uh, the new Bible commentary that D.A. Carson is also uh, involved in. And so he says, verse 28, to, to his own sheep, then, then Jesus gives eternal life. Uh, now, he's also given references. I won't read the references that, that you see in blue. He says, in terms of the sheep metaphor, Jesus has already said that he gives them life to the full abundant life. Now, he plainly states that such, uh, that such, uh, lost my place, that such life is in his own eternal life, frequently hidden in the gospel under the figures of water, bread, light, good pasture. The consequences of knowing his sheep and of his gift of them or to them of eternal life is that they shall, as he says, shall never perish. This is commentary on verse 28, that they shall never perish. It could not be otherwise that they could perish if they have eternal life. And so he talks about the notes in John 6, 51, 58, 8, 51, 52, 11, 26. Even so, the focus is not on the power of the life itself, but on Jesus's power. No one can snatch them out of my hand, not the marauding wood wolf, nor the thieves or robbers, not anyone to think otherwise would entail the conclusion that Jesus has failed in the explicit assignment given to him by the Father. I think that's that word that bears repeating. It would mean that Jesus has failed in the explicit assignment given him 
by the Father to preserve all those given to him, as he reads in John, we read in John 6, 37 through 40, the ultimate security of Jesus' sheep rests with the good shepherd. Now, that's important. Now, I want to go to another uh, commentary that he gives, that D.A. Carson gives. And again, this is not me or some other schlep. This is D.A. Carson. Uh, and in this particular book, let's go back to Lagos here. This is his book. Um, this is his commentary, the New Bible Commentary. And let's just read what he says here in John 10, 28. Let's click on it. And let's slide down to his commentary in verse 28. He says, the force of the words uh, show that they are they have already entered into eternal life. Notice what he says. The force of the words, let's make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see this as well. I want you guys to be able to see. He says, the force of the words here um, show that they, that is the sheep, have already entered into eternal life. The present tense is used. So he's referring back to the Greek. Jesus also made an unmistakable promise concerning their security. Those familiar with the various enemies uh, of an eastern flock of sheep would appreciate the absolute character of that security. Of that security. It is reinforced by the action of the Father, which states, which goes on to state that uh, that they are in his hand. No one can pluck him out of his hand. And this also kind of harkens back to uh, the mighty hand of God as he leads his people um, to salvation. So now that is another person who also has the exact same belief of eternal security. And he's pointing to the Greek in this text, in this text. So we've got D.A. Carson thus far. We've got Michael Burr so far. We've got uh, Daniel Wallace thus far. And we also have um, we also have Bill Mounts. Now, there's one other person who this is the person who kind of as I was um, studying, I was initially studying Hebrew first, but then I got in contact with this particular person. This is um, Brian J. Wright, and he also is a uh, a published scholar. Uh, he's written books such as Revisiting the Corruption of the, of the New Testament. Pretty, <laughs> pretty nerdy book, but it is written by actual Dan Daniel Wallace, and he participates in the writing. Uh, inscriptions, papyri, and other artifacts. Uh, he is a contributor on that. And then also communal reading in the time of Jesus. In other words, what books would were, would would Jesus have read? What were the books that were around? What were the writings that were around when Jesus, um, when he walked the earth? So he, he takes, he obviously he's a scholar and takes a scholarly approach to the word of God. And so I asked the very same question of him about this particular text, John 10, 28. So let's listen to this text or let's listen to this exchange. I've heard people say that, no, that's not quite what it what it means. I said, well, give me an understanding because what seems what what he's negativing is the possibility of perishing. Uh, it's in the subjunctive, so there's no possibility of it. So, well, it, it it you're applying it incorrectly. Is there a possibility for someone who would disagree and would understand Greek to figure out a way to say that this does not apply? So. The Greek is clear that it is the strongest way you can negate this. Mm -hmm. So to say, can anyone come across, come along and say something else? Of course they can. But does the Greek help them? No. Is there something that you can get around a double negative? So there was even a dissertation, either a thesis or dissertation written that I read because uh, I, I um, wrote an article on negate on a specific type of construction in the Greek and negating something. So I had to research how did, how did the Greek negate things. There's really no more emphatic way than a double negative. So you'd have to have some other strong types of arguments from context or uh, the grammar or syntax to try to make any other case other than what it clearly says is they will no not ever perish. They mm -hmm. will never perish. So again, the assumption is who he gives the eternal life to will never perish. That, that, that is a, take that to the bank. Yeah. If uh, they have, if they have eternal life. So then the, the question is, do they really have eternal life? But if somebody yeah. really has eternal life, that will never be taken away. So if you have eternal life, you are going to be, if you are a sheep, if you are saved today, it will never be taken away. This is what the Greek is stating. And again, I understand someone's going to say that's dangerous. That's not true. Fine. Why then does the text read the way it reads? Why is the text written this way? Why is it spoke? Why did Jesus say these words the way that we understand it? Why did he say, why did he use words 
that means the opposite of what he meant? Or why is he using words that disagrees with what maybe another person today says it says? It's clear what this is stating. That part, that part, you it's hard to get away from that. And if someone were to say, well, yeah, um, it's you are never going to perish as long as you remain. Well, here's the problem with that. There's a couple of Old Testament passages where God is speaking of what he's going to do in the future. And he even speaks upon in the future, the sheep and in the future, the shepherd. In Micah 5, 4, uh, he says, uh, and he will arise, speaking of the shepherd and shepherd his flock. This is Jesus in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. Uh, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. Now. Did you catch what he says? And they, the sheep, will remain because he, that is the Lord, this great shepherd, will be great. So we cannot say that uh, the sheep will stop following. The sheep will, will leave. You can leave. Well, no, he says that the sheep will remain. And where this comes from, in two particular passages, one, Jeremiah 32, 39 and 40, he says, God says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me for all their own good and for the good of their children with them. I will make an everlasting covenant and here. Let's, let's listen to this, make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them. So God says, I'm not going to turn away from them. After I put my spirit in them, in their heart, I won't turn away from them. And then the converse is also, uh, I will put my, the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And so here we have God saying, I won't turn away from them. They won't turn away from me. And then obviously the next statement is, well, the only thing that could possibly happen is if someone were to snatch them out of his hand, since he's not going to turn away and they, we won't turn away from him. But that's also been foreclosed as well, including in Ezekiel 36, 27. Let's start in verse 25, as a matter of fact. Notice who the active agent is. This is this is God says, I, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, the reason for this, because remember, we have been told that the heart is desperately wicked or sick. Uh, no one can trust it. We are, we go astray from the womb. This is who we are. We are not good people. Our heart is bad. Remember, in Deuteronomy 10, God tells the Jews in Deuteronomy 10, 16, to circumcise their heart and stiffen their neck no longer. They don't. As a matter of fact, he keeps telling them to fix their heart, to get right, to trust him, to follow him. They never do. And so before that they get punished, even look to the future, God says that I will, in, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he says that I will circumcise their heart and I and then cause them to walk in his teachings. He says it also in Deuteronomy 30 and 6. So what is God after? To fix our heart, to cause us to walk with him. How do we know so? Because he reiterates this in uh, Ezekiel. Now in verse 30, chapter 36, verse 27, he says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So what will happen when he puts his spirit in them? That they will walk in his statutes. He won't turn away from them. They won't turn away from him. And these very same sheep are going to remain. Someone will say, well, Corey, he's only talking about Israel. The problem with that is, are we to say that Israel is the only one that's going to have the spirit of the Lord put in us. Jesus just explained, explained to us about his sheep and told us that not only that those particular sheep, but he says he has sheep of another flock. It's only, could only be the Gentiles. And we know he's not speaking about just the, the, just the Jews who will have the spirit in them because notice what he says in John three, he's speaking about being born again. All of us who are saved, we are born again. We are born from above. Ganethe Noth, which is what that word means. And he uses, he says it three ways, born from above, born again, born of spirit, born of water and spirit, born of spirit. So born again, born of water and spirit, or also, uh, uh, or born of spirit. So born again, born of water and spirit, born of spirit. All of those are being born from heaven. The Holy Spirit is giving us this rebirth. And we know this is the Holy Spirit doing so. And we don't, we don't cause this because Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 3, that he has caused us to be born again. We didn't do so. He caused us to be born again. And then again, this is not speaking about just the Jews. One, uh, first Peter is not speaking about just the Jews. Uh, John, first John 5 is not speaking about just the Jews. He says that 
whoever it is that's believing that Jesus Christ, that person is born of God. That refers to all of us. We know that because John said calls us his little children who believes. And he says that because of this, he says that we are overcome. We will overcome the world. It is our faith that's going to cause us to overcome. And so those of us who have faith are going to overcome. Why do we have faith that we can overcome? Because as he said, we have been born again, born of God. And John 1 tells us, verse 12, he says that, but as many as receive this word, but as many, high soy, so this is, this is all inclusive, not just of Jews, but also of Gentiles, but as many as received him, kind of like what Paul says in Romans 8, those who have received him, the Holy Spirit, that we are then also led by the Lord and we are children of God. If we are, if we have the Holy Spirit, we are saved. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we are not saved. But back to this passage in John 1, he says to them, he gave the right to become children of God. That includes us as Gentiles, even to those who believe in his name, who were, look what he says, who were born not of blood. So not that you were born of blood, uh, nor you, were you born of the will of flesh, nor were you born of the will of man. But how were you born? Ek feu egenethesan, which is you were born of God. So you're being born again, which is what Peter says, which is what Jesus is saying. You are being born of God, not on your own. You don't do anything about it. This is what, this is God's work. This is why Ezekiel says, I will do these things and cause you to walk this way. So why we can understand this Greek rule, how we know it's going to be true, how we know it's going to be effective, because he also lets us peek behind the curtains and see that the Holy Spirit will be the one working in us to complete what he started, which is why Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, the work that I began in you, I'm confident that the work that he began in you, he will complete. The work that he, that is God, began in you, he will complete it. Not you, he will complete it. He's doing what you could not do, what you would not do. And we know that being the case because in Luke 8, what does he tell us? He gives us this parable of the seeds and the soils and what is the seed? Well, he tells us in verse 11, the seed is the word, the word of God. I don't care how good the word of God is. If it falls on the wrong soil, which is the heart, it won't do any good. And he gives us three examples. Verse 12, those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe or be believing, which is what this word says. Hena me pis, pistusantes, which is that they will not be believing and use the present active participle be believing because that's how he refers to us Christians as those who are believing, but the devil doesn't want that to happen. So the word is then taken away. Uh, we'll talk about another time how that actually happens. Uh, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. So they hear the word, receive it. And these have no, no firm root. They, again, speaking about the soil, they believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Well, how is that possible that they believe for a while? Well, again, the word falls on bad soil or a bad heart. These are clearly not people that are saved. These are people that in this case that have a mental assent. They understand the right thing and know that they should get saved, that, that Jesus did die for them, but they just make a mental uh, assent. They make a, 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 a head knowledge type of a, <laughs> a confession. They don't really believe it. They don't really, they're not really um, placing their faith in what they're stating. And then continuing, he says, uh, verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns. These are those who have heard the word and as they go their way, they are choked with the worries and riches of, and pleasures of this world or this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But now look at verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, well, what's the good soil? The good heart. These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. They've heard the word in an honest, good heart. And what do they do when they hear the word in an honest and good heart? In other words, when the word comes and takes root in a good heart, a heart that has been transformed, that has been regenerated, that has been born from above, which you had nothing to do with, then he says, and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. That's what's going to happen. They will hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So it's a true statement to say that a Christian, in order to stay a Christian, to be saved, you have to bear fruit. You have to abide. You have to remain. But what does Jesus just say? You will do. He says, if the word is received in a good heart, then you will do those things. And how do you get the good heart? Well, not because of you, because of what uh, Ezekiel says, because of what Jesus says, because of what Jeremiah says, because of what Peter says. This is a work of God. And the good thing is, because we are his sheep, how do we become his sheep? We are told that we are his sheep because we were given to the son by the father. All that the father gives to me 
will come. All that the Father gives to me. Um, pan, hadid, pan hadidosin, all that the Father gives, all whom he has given to me. So notice that the tense, that this is a present active tense. And so these are all the ones that he is giving now and continually giving. But notice the shift. Um, they will come to me and I will certainly not cast out. By the way, he uses this, this also, again, this emphatic negation of a subjunctive, ume ekbalo, which is uh, I will there, the possibility of me casting him out is, is never going to happen at any point in time now or in the future. Verse nine, this is the will of him who sent me that all that he has given me, I will lose none, but raise it up in the last day. Now, I want you to notice what he says. He says, all the ones that he, uh, the one that sent me, in order that, this is the purpose for that all the ones that he has given, this is perfect tense. So he, this perfect tense is a completed action from the past. All of the ones that he's given me, he's given them to me in order that all of them will be raised in the last day. And I won't lose one. He says, I will not lose one. Even the English is bearing this out. All the ones that he's given me, I will lose none, but raise them in the last day. He says, for this is the will of my father, of the father, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have future tense. You will have eternal life. As a matter of fact, he also says something similar to this in verse 47. Notice what he says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you that he who believes, the believing one, hapis to one, eke, has eternal life. He has right now, present tense, if you believe right now, you have life into the ages. Not you will have it, although he already said that. So you will have it. Oh, by the way, you do have, it, which is why Dr. Carson says that it is clear that you have eternal life right now. The life that you have, you it's already begun in you. That's why he says, use the present tense, eke, you have right now life, and for how long? Into the ages. So this is the point that these scholars have understood. Oh, by the way, let's go back to John 5. Before we go back to John 10, he makes a statement. He says in John 5, 24, he says, I say to you that he who hears my word and believes in me, the believing one, the pistol on, uh, the one that's believing in me who sent me has, again, he has, present tense, eke zoe, and I don't, he has life right now into the ages and does not, look what he says, and does not come into judgment. This person will not go into judgment. Kai es krisen uk erkatai, which is into judgment, not he will come. You will not go into judgment. Are you a believer now? Are you a sheep right now? He says, you will not go into judgment. But look what he says, but, medbe bacon, but you have already passed, ek thu, uh, thanatu, which is you have already passed out of death. And you have already passed into life. So the life, you already have passed into it. And for how long is this life going to last? Into eternity. There is no other Greek rendering for this as well. There is no way to get past it. Say, well, no, this doesn't quite mean that. If so, be willing to hear you. But you would also obviously not have to deal with me. Uh, I'm going to fight for, for what I see. But so to the actual Greek scholars that when you want to read and study Greek or consult a commentary or a lexicon, you got to look at their work and they're going to say the exact same thing. But more to the point, even in the English, I think it's pretty clear. You have passed from death. You will not come into judgment. Because you have already, or but you've already passed from death and you have passed into life. So I think it's pretty clear just with the wording, just with how it states that I think it's clear what God is doing. He's doing what you could not do. The fact that he had to come and die for our sins and then for someone to say, well, yeah, that still puts us back at square one. Because in the past, you could have your sins atoned for and then later not be atoned for. Well, that's the exact same situation we have now. Well, then what in the world is the blood for? What is the Holy Spirit doing? What is Christ doing? What is the Lord doing in us that would allow us? So he does not mean that he who began a good work in us, that he's not going to complete it. He does not mean that we have passed from death. He does not mean that we already have life right now. He does not mean that we will have life even in the future. He does not mean that it's impossible to perish into the future. He does not mean that we will remain. He does not mean that we will that we will never follow a strange voice. He does not mean that we will hear his voice. He does not mean that we will keep following him. He does not mean that we will bear fruit. He doesn't mean any of those things. He means what you say. That is, if you dis disagree, he means that if you do this and this, then you'll get all these promises. The problem is, in none of these passages where he emphatically states this, is the word if there. There are warning passages. That is for people who might think that there are. Those people that make that head knowledge um, uh, a statement that they believe in Christ. There's a lot of folks that say that they're Christian. A lot of people. 
And that's why the warnings go out. But if you are, make sure that you are. James 519 is a warning pastor to make sure anyone amongst the brothers, not the brethren, but amongst, which is why he says in toys uh, amongst them. If you depart, then he calls them sinners. Christians are never called sinners. Not once in the Bible are Christians called sinners. And so you've got these warning pastors. Paul says, examine yourself. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you can agree with me. You can disagree. That's fine. I'm not going to be upset. I just think that you are living your life the hardest way possible. He has given you an all expense paid trip to heaven. You can sit back, relax and enjoy the ride. But instead, you think that you've got to get out and push and pull the ship. You've got to push it. You've got to drive it. You've got to navigate through the rough waves when really he's already there. All of the accommodations are paid for. You are without question going to be there. You're working on the wrong things. You are trying to impress yourself, secure your salvation, the things that you could not do. Meanwhile, he did the heavy lifting. Otherwise, if you think he did not, why did he die on the cross? Amen. Amen.